Welcome to the New York State Museum's World War I Centennial Exhibit, A Spirit of Sacrifice, New York State in the First World War. Uh, the exhibit's title comes from a Liberty Bond uh, speech by New York Governor Charles Whitman, uh, who is exhorting New Yorkers to continue to sacrifice uh, both financially, industrially, and through service in the nation's military. Uh, as we go through the gallery, you'll notice uh, that poster art is featured very prominently uh, throughout the exhibit. Uh, World War I was truly the, the golden age of posters. While posters had existed uh, as a medium for advertising uh, well before the First World War, uh, during the war, uh, for the first time, governments uh, actively use those same marketing uh, techniques uh, that had been used by advertisers, uh, but only to get uh, Americans to uh, contribute and do things for the war effort. Uh, this is uh, most well known uh, through James Montgomery Flagg's uh, iconic Uncle Sam Wants You poster. Uh, James Montgomery Flagg, a native New Yorker born and raised in Pelham Manor, New York, uh, lived and worked his entire life in New York State. He ultimately contributes uh, 43 uh, posters uh, to the war effort, including his Uncle Sam poster. Uh, this poster becomes uh, iconic for the World War uh, for many reasons, uh, but for, the, for one, it, it visually uh, creates a relationship between the poster viewer uh, and uh, the, this kind of amorphous idea of a federal government uh, by giving him the name Uncle Sam, a name that had been used uh, in the past, uh, we're really, not only is the U.S. government asking you for something, uh, but it's a member of your own family is asking for your help. Now, World War I uh, begins in uh, July of 19. 14, with the assassination of the Austrian Archduke uh, Franz Ferdinand and his wife uh, in Sarajevo in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, by, uh, by a Bosnian Serb nationalist. Uh, Austria quickly blames Serbia, uh, the independent kingdom, uh, for this attack uh, and, and threatens uh, retaliation uh, unless the Serbs meet a number of uh, concessions, which the Serbs actually uh, are readily uh, willing to do. Nonetheless, Austria proceeds with its push to war, uh, which triggers this series of alliances that had developed over uh, the decades uh, of the 19th century, in which Russia comes to the aid of Serbia, uh, Germany uh, sides with Austria, and then France and Britain are eventually drawn into uh, the war as well as the rest of the continent. Uh, it truly becomes a world war uh, and a war of empires uh, as these nations and Europe quickly uh, begin calling on uh, their colonial subjects uh, to send men and supplies to the war effort in uh, Europe. Uh, on the wall behind me here, uh, we highlight the, the, the various goings on uh, in Europe uh, between 1914 and the American involvement in April and 1917, uh, including many of the reasons that ultimately lead to American uh, involvement in the First World War, including the use of unrestricted submarine warfare by the Germans, uh, highlighted by the 1915 sinking of the HMS uh, Lusitania, a, a British passenger liner, uh, killing uh, nearly 1,500 people, including 128 Americans. Uh, we have a uh, headline from the New York Times, uh, a German plot to attack the United States through Mexico, in which Germany offers uh, Mexico a military alliance in the event of war with the United States. Uh, and then uh, we also want to highlight the fact that New York newspapers are covering this war uh, despite the fact that America is not involved in it. And this is epitomized with the, the headline about the Battle of the Somme in which the British Army has lost 414,000 uh, soldiers in a six-month battle. Uh, this number is significant in terms of the American uh, participation in the war because uh, at the time of the Battle of the Somme, the U.S. Army uh, numbers only uh, 120,000 officers and men. Uh, so in one single battle, the British Army has lost more than twice the entire American Army. While the United States doesn't officially declare war until April of 1917, uh, the war here in New York really does begin uh, in 1914. New York, with its history of immigration, uh, is a very uh, heterogeneous society, um, co uh, cosmopolitan society, uh, and therefore uh, the war in Europe immediately draws the interest of uh, these newly arrived Americans. Uh, thousands of uh, European immigrants uh, and uh, return to their native lands, uh, to France, to Germany, to Austria, to Britain. Uh, but not only do 
uh, these expatriate uh, Europeans return to, to the war in Europe, but Americans go to war as well. Uh, the posters pictured on the wall here were all printed and posted in New York State. Uh, the one that I want to talk about right now is this Britishers You're Needed poster. Uh, the British make a concerted effort uh, to kind of draw in the idea of the United States as this Anglo-American kind of connection and really try to make a concerted effort to recruit Americans uh, both into the British Army and into the uh, Canadian uh, Expeditionary Forces uh, to the north. Um, because of the long contiguous border, uh, thousands of New Yorkers cross the border and join the Canadian Army uh, during the early part of World War I. Uh, it's during a cabinet meeting, uh, First Lord of the Admiralty Winston Churchill actually makes a statement that the surest way to guarantee American involvement in the First World War uh, is for American bloodshed uh, to be spilled on the battlefields of Europe. Uh, Churchill and others very early on recognized that uh, if Americans begin dying uh, on the Western Front in Europe and in France, that eventually American uh, public opinion will begin to change against the, uh, the central powers of Germany and Austria-Hungary, uh, and Americans will hopefully uh, begin clamoring uh, for the United States to enter the war. Uh, as I mentioned, thousands of uh, other Americans joined the Canadian Expeditionary Force. This is a poster from what was known as the Canadian Legion, uh, in which, uh, as you can see, uh, every man uh, American from Colonel to Cook, it was a, a, a unit set aside uh, to be commanded and, and filled by uh, United States citizens. Uh, other Americans served uh, in other capacities um, as part of the, the Lafayette Escadrille, this famed flying corps uh, in the French Army, uh, flying for France. And then you'll see the poster on the far left, Czechoslovaks join our free callers, was appealing to the Czechoslovak uh, immigrants in, the, in New York uh, based on Wilson's kind of rhetoric of uh, self-determination for nations, uh, Czechoslovakia at the time uh, was divided up between the Austro-Hungarian, the German, and the Russian empires. Uh, there was no free Czechoslovakia, and many of these immigrants saw the war as an opportunity uh, to gain that independence. And the last way that uh, many Americans served uh, in the European war was as ambulance drivers as part of the American Field Service, AFS. Uh, this organization was organized in New York City and Boston and recruited primarily from uh, universities uh, in the Northeast, but across the country. Uh, by, the end of, by the time the United States enters the war in April of 1917, 1,200 uh, Americans have joined the American Field Service, including more than 400 uh, New Yorkers. So approximately one out of three uh, of the AFS members come from, uh, from New York State. In the case in the center, you'll see uh, the weapons of a, a rapidly uh, industrializing uh, war effort. Uh, World War I sees the perfection of the machine gun as a uh, weapon of war. Uh, the first introductions of uh, poison gas uh, on the battlefields. Uh, and you can see uh, the evolution of the gas masks from a relatively uh, primitive uh, French gas mask, which is much, not much more than a, a, a canvas bag with a cotton, uh, treated cotton filter uh, in the mouth uh, to the more sophisticated uh, 1917 uh, German gas mask with a canister filter, as well as helmets uh, and other paraphernalia and weapons uh, from the various powers uh, fighting in Europe. Quickly, as it begins to expand and begins drawing in its colonial forces, uh, find the British actually find themselves uh, unable to meet demand uh, with their own industries. And for that, they actually turn uh, to New York and to New Yorkers. Uh, Remington Arms, uh, headquartered in Ilion, New York, in the Mohawk Valley, uh, is actually contracted to construct and, and build one million of rifles similar to this uh, at their factory in Ilion. Uh, this becomes the primary uh, rifle of the British Army uh, throughout the war. Uh, and then we have a Mauser rifle uh, from the Germans, the Model 1898, uh, with bayonet. Uh, the primary uh, long arm of the German army uh, through both world wars, actually. Uh, helmets uh, from the various combatants, uh, including uh, helmets, the, the iconic Piklov helmet uh, from the German army uh, with its pointed spike on the top, uh, French, British, and Belgian helmets as well. Here in New York, uh, New York City is the center of uh, the pacifist movement at the start of the war. Uh, 
it's also the, the kind of the center of uh, kind of left-leaning socialist and other groups uh, and political organizations uh, in the United States. And as such, New York plays an oversized role in the debate over uh, whether or not the United States should become involved in the war. Uh, in August of 1914, shortly after the war uh, had started, thousands of Americans gather at uh, New York's Union Square uh, to protest and rally against American intervention in the war uh, with uh, leaders such as former uh, Senator, Secretary of State, and Nobel Peace Prize winner Elihu Root, uh, Columbia uh, University professor, uh, President uh, Nicholas Murray Butler, and others uh, begin uh, becoming leaders in uh, groups such as the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, which begins calling for the end of war as a uh, foreign policy tool, uh, the eradication of war on the planet. Uh, they're allied with uh, men like Stephen Weiss, the leading German, uh, Jewish American voice uh, in the nation. Uh, and these people are arguing uh, that the United States uh, should avoid war at all costs, um, but also that war should not be used as a uh, means of resolving conflicts uh, and uh, dif disagreements uh, diplomatically. Uh, as word of atrocities being committed by Germans uh, continually uh, are leaked out of Europe uh, between 1914 and 1917. Uh, this slowly begins to change American public opinion about the war, um, but particularly for Stephen Weiss, uh, who ultimately begins to see uh, the defeat of uh, the German, uh, Imperial German Army, uh, really as the only means of guaranteeing a uh, pacifist uh, future uh, for the United States and for the world. And when Weiss and other pacifists like him uh, begin making this shift uh, away from pacifism and anti-war uh, arguments. Uh, it really kind of breaks down the last bulwark uh, of uh, President Wilson's defense against uh, American entry into the war. Uh, at the same time all of that is happening, uh, you also see the rise of what becomes known as the preparedness movement, uh, led in large part by former President uh, and New Yorker Theodore Roosevelt, uh, who begins arguing uh, not that America should immediately enter the war, though that was probably closer to Roosevelt's actual uh, desire. Uh, but as an astute politician, he recognized that American opinion was not ready uh, to go that far. So he begins arguing for what he called preparedness, uh, the idea that we need to increase our military spending, increase our prepared, preparedness to go to war. Uh, preparedness takes its most visible form uh, at Plattsburgh uh, in Clinton County, New York, with the first of what become uh, annual citizens military training camps in which hundreds and thousands of young American men actually pay their own way to travel to Plattsburgh uh, to be trained uh, as uh, officers in what would become a new, uh, greatly expanded uh, American officer corps. Uh, preparedness eventually permeates uh, American society to such a degree that uh, even the New York Yankees uh, were advocating for preparedness. Uh, instead of doing pregame rituals uh, such as uh, fielding and batting practice, they would actually do military drills on uh, the field, uh, both at the Yankee Stadium and while they were traveling uh, to away games around the country. Finally, as all of these converging forces kind of begin piling on President Wilson, he goes before Congress on April 2nd, 1917, uh, and asks Congress for a declaration of war. Uh, after four days of debate, the, the Congress finally agrees and, and declares war on uh, Imperial Germany. Uh, therefore, the United States uh, enters. It's the first major European war being fought in Europe um, and really takes its first steps as an emerging world power. Uh, again, we talk about poster art uh, really becoming prominent. Another James Montgomery flag uh, image, uh, civilization calls every man, woman, and child. And this poster, Wake Up America, it, really advocating for the, the idea that, that the United States had been sleeping for three years uh, while these atrocities were being committed uh, by, ostensibly by uh, Imperial Germany uh, in uh, Europe. What's also of note in this poster is it calls for every man, woman, and child. And that's important in the First World War because unlike previous American conflicts, this war will truly uh, require the contributions of every facet and every level of American society. Uh, men to fight the war, women uh, to serve in factories, uh, and children will also be uh, called upon to contribute to the war effort as well. Uh, as the United States prepares for war, uh, New York also uh, begins gearing up for war. Uh, 
uh, New York as the most populous uh, state in the nation will ultimately contribute more than 10% of all military forces uh, to the American cause, uh, one out of every 10 soldiers coming from the state of New York. Uh, here in the exhibit, we'll talk about uh, the very specific New York-focused units um, that emerged during the war, predominantly the 27th Division, which is comprised of more than 30,000 New York National Guardsmen, the 77th Division, a draft division that comes almost exclusively from New York City uh, and the immigrant neighborhoods there, uh, and the 78th Division uh, coming from uh, primarily Rochester and Buffalo, uh, as well as New Jersey, where it's headquartered. But because there are so many New Yorkers in the conflict and in the war, in the military service uh, during the time, uh, New Yorkers can be found in uh, virtually every regiment, every division, every facet of the, of the American Army. Uh, not even just the American Army, the American Navy, uh, and here we have a uniform from the United States Marine Corps. Uh, the United States Army was so short-handed in terms of the numbers of men it had ready to go to war uh, that a brigade of U.S. Marines is actually attached to the Army's second division uh, and sent to France to fight alongside American soldiers. Uh, this is the first time and really the only time that Marines uh, are actually embedded and integrated into uh, an Army fighting force. Amongst the units from New York specifically that come into uh, to action are, is the, uh, the 15th New York. Uh, this poster is uh, really eye-catching because it features an African-American soldier. The 15th New York ultimately earns its reputation and its nickname, the Harlem Hellfighters, uh, on the battlefields of Europe. Uh, it's the only African-American unit in the New York National Guard. Uh, and for African-Americans who wanted to volunteer here in New York, this was really their only avenue to do so. Uh, to be drafted into or to join the regular American Army uh, virtually guaranteed that these soldiers would uh, be relegated to uh, non-combat duties and labor duties or pioneer uh, battalion duties uh, rather than as combat units, whereas the 15th New York was an infantry regiment in the New York National Guard and at least gave them a, a sense that they would have a, an opportunity uh, to serve uh, as a fighting uh, member of the United States Army. Uh, as the United States uh, Army is ramping up to go to war, uh, there are two competing forces that begin to emerge politically uh, here in New York and in Washington, D.C. Uh, because the New York National Guard is the largest National Guard in the nation, uh, there is a lot of expectation amongst uh, the other states that the New York National Guard uh, will be the first to be sent to France, will be the first to go into combat, and therefore will be the first to, su to sustain casualties uh, in, uh, in the war. There's fear in the War Department that, uh, that this will begin to turn New York State's uh, public opinion uh, against the war effort, and because of New York's critical uh, industrial uh, manpower and financial resources, uh, it, it's imperative that New York remains committed to the war effort. Uh, the other competing force is that these states begin to worry that the New York National Guard um, would be the first to be sent over to France, uh, the first to go into combat, and the first to achieve, uh, achieve glory and fame. Uh, before any of the other National Guards uh, could be uh, deployed into France. Um, as such, the, the, the Army comes up with a compromise in which they create uh, a newly formed division, uh, the 42nd Division. It gains the nickname the Rainbow Division, uh, based on a quote from its then Chief of Staff, Colonel Douglas MacArthur, uh, who states that the division will span the United States like a rainbow, uh, comprising National Guard units from 26 states and the District of Columbia. Uh, New York, because of the prominence of its National Guard, is given the honor of uh, supplying a regiment of infantry uh, to, the, to this newly created 42nd Division. Uh, the 15th New York becomes the first New York regiment uh, to bring itself up to wartime strength. Uh, its, its commander, uh, a white colonel named William Hayward, applies to the War Department to be included uh, as New York's contribution in the Rainbow Division uh, and is starkly and bluntly told that black is not a color of the rainbow. Uh, in its stead, uh, the War Department selects the 69th Infantry Regiment of the New York National Guard, uh, the famed Fighting Irish of Civil War fame, uh, to go. Uh, this poster, while not as graphically uh, appealing as many of the others in the exhibit, uh, it also tells an important story. And it's the line, go to the front with your friends, don't be drafted into some regiment where you don't know anyone. Uh, and this was a very convincing uh, sales argument and kind of a reason for, for young men to potentially join the National Guard. Uh, many of these young men uh, living on farms and in small towns across upstate New York uh, had never left their villages, let alone uh, gone overseas or gone, gone to another country. 
So the idea that they could go uh, to war alongside people they knew uh, was very attractive. Unfortunately, in the modern uh, mechanized warfare that was emerging in the Western Front, uh, when New York's National Guard um, or the divisions of conscripted soldiers coming from New York State, when these units go into combat, they don't suffer markedly higher casualties uh, than other American units. Uh, but when these units go into combat, they're all New Yorkers. So therefore, uh, when the 69th Infantry later federalizes, the 165th Infantry Regiment goes into combat, or the 27th Division uh, goes, into, goes over the top. Uh, the casualties uh, are all New Yorkers, and therefore New York suffers uh, disproportionately uh, in terms of the, the number of casualties. Nearly 14,000 New Yorkers uh, are killed during the First World War. Now, World War I uh, inaugurates uh, really the first federally administered draft. While there had been a draft in the Civil War, it was administered at the state level. Uh, for the first time, uh, the, the draft is being run by the federal government uh, and the states are being directed. Uh, the term selective service comes into use during the First World War. It's the same uh, system that the United States has in place today. Uh, even the term selective service was part of this kind of marketing campaign for the war effort. It wasn't that this was a draft. Uh, this, was a, this was the entire nation enlisting in mass and then uh, the government would choose those, uh, would select those um, privileged uh, to serve. Uh, for those that weren't drafted, uh, really the, the options were the Marine Corps, uh, the National Guard, or the Navy. So here we should have some posters uh, reflecting uh, those options. Uh, you really don't see very many U.S. Army recruiting posters after uh, the summer of 1917. Um, the last poster I want to talk about in this first section of the exhibit, uh, Enlist, on which side of the window are you, uh, is really an important uh, poster uh, in the narrative of poster art during the war. Uh, this was a poster that was uh, part of a nationwide design competition. It's won by a young uh, student at the University at the Chicago School of Art named Laura Bray. Uh, this poster is a fantastic example of what becomes known as coercive volunteerism, or what we today would know as kind of call peer pressure. Uh, the idea that because other people are doing something, uh, you feel compelled to do so. Uh, in this case, we have a young man dressed in what can really only be described kind of as a dandyish outfit with the bow tie and the nice suit kind of lurking in the shadows uh, inside as uh, other young men march off to war. Uh, Laura Bray's name is uh, prominently displayed on the poster. Uh, so not only now, because it, we, we can see that it was done by and, and created by a female artist, not only is this poster challenging the courage of this young man, uh, but it's also challenging the masculinity. And so for people to be confronted by this kind of thing uh, was very significant in terms of uh, trying to compel uh, people to do, uh, to carry out certain actions. Uh, when others, in other instances, when people would buy liberty bonds or donate to the Red Cross, they would get a lapel pin, uh, which they were expected to prominently display uh, on their jackets. Uh, that way, if you were on a trolley or on a, uh, a train or walking down the street, um, and all of a sudden everybody else is wearing this pin and you don't have one, um, people are both going to start looking at you questioningly, but also you're going to feel compelled uh, to rush off and, and purchase that Liberty Bond or uh, make that donation. Uh, and the last thing in this section that we're going to talk about is the, uh, the New York Port of Embarkation. Uh, the Port of New York becomes the, the critical uh, port in the war effort. Approximately 80% of the materials uh, being sent to Europe uh, are shipped through the Port of New York, and about 70% of the men uh, going to fight the war uh, leave from New York Harbor. And therefore, it really becomes a, a, a critical uh, point in the American uh, war effort. So we've now left uh, the port of New York. We've arrived in the trenches of the Western Front. Uh, and this uh, section of the exhibit uh, is intended to, to give, you, to give uh, viewers a sense of uh, what life was like for every American soldier uh, in the trenches uh, in France. Um, we wanted to continue the, the continuity of poster art, uh, but to contrast the, the stylistic view of warfare on the Western Front with what really was being experienced by American soldiers. Uh, here on the, in the display, we, uh, we feature things that will be common and, and probably resonate with many of our uh, visitors and viewers, uh, things that were being sent to the soldiers as care packages, um, matches and gum uh, and toiletries uh, in a way that would meaningfully kind of uh, affirm to American soldiers that they were not forgotten and that they were not
abandoned by the, the people on the f home front. Um, not only did uh, one out of every 10 uh, soldiers come from New York, uh, nearly 45,000 New Yorkers served in the American Navy. Uh, to my left, uh, we have a uh, U.S. Navy mine, a uh, naval mine, uh, similar to the type that would have been used in uh, barricading and blockading actions uh, in the North Sea in attempts to uh, contain uh, the German U-boats in harbors in Germany and uh, in uh, Belgium and France. Uh, this mine uh, is one that would have been charged uh, had it been used uh, <coughs> at Iona Island uh, down in the Hudson River, uh, Iona Island uh, being one of the t largest uh, naval uh, munitions depots uh, in the country through both world wars. Uh, it was selected uh, for its location uh, in the Hudson River estuary, uh, far enough inland uh, up the river uh, to be out of the range of enemy guns, um, but also in a river to the point where it was not navigable by submerged submarines. Therefore, ships could safely dock, uh, take on munitions uh, before uh, sailing uh, to war. And as I mentioned in the, in the first section of the exhibit, uh, we saw the emergence of gas warfare uh, in France uh, in 1915 and 1916. Uh, here we talk about gas warfare, uh, highlighting some of the, the implements used by American soldiers, including the iconic uh, boxed respirator uh, and gas mask, um, a wooden gas mask, uh, gas alarm, uh, which much like a child's alarm today, you would spin it and it would make a rattling sound and that was used to alert uh, American soldiers of the impending uh, gas attack. Uh, and things that maybe people don't necessarily think about, including this, uh, this pair of eyeglasses. Uh, when the British, uh, when, when gas war warfare uh, first er breaks out uh, and the British adopted a similar style of gas mask, uh, the soldiers that wore glasses actually had a hard time getting their gas masks on over top of the glasses. Uh, and they were kind of left with having the, the option of being able to see or being able to breathe, but many times they couldn't do both. Uh, this pair of glasses was actually specifically designed uh, for uh, use with the American gas mask. And the poster on the wall next to the case uh, is a good example of how uh, the war was uh, calling upon every level of society. Uh, this stop, do your bit, save the pit uh, poster would have been uh, displayed uh, in a uh, school cafeteria uh, over a bin uh, in which students uh, who had uh, cherry pits or peach pits or um, stones from any kind of pitted fruits uh, would be expected to drop the, those pits into this bin, uh, which would then be taken uh, for the manufacture of activated charcoal, uh, which was then used in uh, American gas masks. Uh, while soldiers were, were living in, in the trenches, um, there's a misperception amongst many that, that Warfare in World War I on the Western Front was just constant fighting and constant shooting. In fact, there was lots of periods of quiet and lots of periods of boredom. Uh, and one of the things that occupied soldiers' time was the creation of what becomes known as trench art. Uh, so here we have some examples of canteens and mess kits um, that were engraved with unit insignias, uh, but also uh, a little bit more elaborately, the two uh, artillery uh, shell casings in the back um, elaborately uh, worked in uh, etched and uh, designed um, by soldiers uh, while they were passing the time. World War I we uh, also is, sees the emergence of, uh, of aircraft as a uh, weapon of war. Uh, here we have some uh, materials used by American airmen, including the, the leather jacket and scarf uh, used by Anderson Bauer, a pilot who uh, was raised in Glens Falls, uh, New York, and a uh, Lewis machine gun uh, manufactured to uh, mount inside of American airplanes, uh, manufactured by Savage Arms Company uh, in Utica, New York. While all of the, uh, the death and destruction uh, of the First World War is happening, uh, 1918 also sees the, the emergence and the outbreak of a uh, epidemic of influenza, uh, starting at Camp Funston in Kansas, uh, but quickly spreading globally, uh, killing um, millions of not only civilians, but also uh, greatly impacting uh, American young men of fighting age. Uh, approximately half uh, of the American casualties in the First World War uh, come as a result of uh, influenza. Uh, 
Uh, and what this creates in terms of the, the correspondence going back and forth between American soldiers uh, on the Western Front and uh, their loved ones back home uh, is a real sense of fear. Uh, not only are these soldiers having to worry about what's happening uh, to them on the battlefield, but they're now worried about their loved ones um, back home. Uh, cities across the, the state and across the nation, actually, uh, the city of Binghamton bans uh, gatherings of more than four people in an effort to try and curb uh, this epidemic. In the matter of just a couple of weeks, the, the, the epidemic flares from New York City uh, with cases reported across the state to Buffalo uh, in just two weeks. Uh, and this creates a really uh, dire situation, uh, both for the American Army uh, and the American home front. Uh, this next section of the uh, exhibit uh, deals with the organization of the American Expeditionary Force and uh, the role of New York State's uh, soldiers uh, in that uh, force. Uh, we have on the far left a uh, traditional or a standard uh, enlisted man's uniform from the American Expeditionary Force. Uh, this one a medical corps off, uh, a soldier from the, uh, the 27th Division, the New York National Guard Division. Uh, on the far right we have a, a, a tunic uh, worn by a volunteer for the uh, YWCA. Um, groups such as the YWCA, the YMCA, the Knights of Columbus, the Red Cross uh, sent volunteers uh, by the hundreds uh, to aid to, to provide uh, comfort services uh, to American soldiers on the Western Front. Uh, and the uniform at the center, uh, arguably the, the most significant of all, uh, is a uh, U.S. Army Women's Nurses Corps, U.S. Army Nurses Corps uniform. Uh, and the reason I, I say that this is the most significant uniform uh, in this case uh, is this uh, World War I is the first conflict in which women uh, are actually allowed to serve in the uniforms of the United States military. They had served as nurses uh, in previous conflicts, but as volunteers either at, at field hospitals or um, at hospitals in uh, cities near the battlefields. Uh, for the first time, uh, American women are donning the uniform of the United States and going to war on its behalf. Uh, and this is critical because in, in terms of the era uh, that World War I occurs. This is also the height of the women's suffrage movement uh, here in the United States and here in New York in particular. Uh, with uh, the vote in the ultimate passage of suffrage in New York State in 1917. Uh, uh, women uh, in the uniform of the United States Army create a very powerful weapon uh, for suffragists in their arguments uh, in favor of uh, passage of women's suffrage. Uh, if you're going to allow women uh, to wear the uniform uh, of the American government or the American Army, uh, how can you justify not letting, giving them the ability to vote uh, for those men uh, are, to, uh, who are going to ultimately make the decisions to send them to war. Uh, in the case opposite, uh, we have the first uh, unit that is highlighted uh, from New York State, the 77th Division. Uh, this draft division, uh, largely of conscripted soldiers uh, from New York City, uh, really becomes a uh, test case for, uh, for uh, immigrant soldiers uh, fighting in the United States Army. Uh, because of the metro cosmopolitan nature of, of the division, there are, are numerous languages being spoken. Uh, many of these soldiers have just recently arrived in the United States. And the question becomes uh, whether or not uh, these men uh, will fight uh, loyally uh, for their adopted country. Uh, and then the other question is, can uh, this diverse group of men be brought together and trained as a cohesive fighting unit um, in order to uh, to successfully carry out a, a war um, like the one being fought in Europe. Uh, for the 77th Division and the men of the, of the unit, uh, they answer both uh, resoundingly in the affirmative. Um, by the end of the conflict in November of 1918, the 77th is cre credited uh, with having made the greatest advances in territory of any unit uh, in the American Army by the Chief of Staff, uh, General Peyton March. Um, and what while we don't talk about in this exhibit, we don't focus on uh, the military tactics uh, or a blow-by-blow -blow account of military battles, uh, we wanted to really make sure that we were able to uh, allow ourselves to focus on uh, the, face, the faces of the war. Uh, and with the 77th Division, we highlight uh, a man named uh, Captain uh, Eddie Grant. Uh, Grant had, uh, prior to uh, joining the American Army, had been a professional baseball player and was a member of uh, the 19... Uh, 15 uh, New York Giants um, World Series championship team. Uh, 
Uh, and so the artifact that represents him is a, what's, what was known as a tobacco felt, um, which was sold with, by cigar companies. It would accompany your cigars when you purchased them. The idea was that if you collected the set, they could all be sewn together um, to create a quilt uh, depicting the entire World Series team. Uh, and they did this uh, for numerous teams uh, throughout the 1910s. Here we talk about the 27th Division, the New York National Guard Division, uh, with a tunic uh, worn by a New York National Guard soldier uh, during the First World War. And the helmet actually belonged to the unit's commander, General uh, John Orion. Uh, in fact, the, the, the insignia of the unit uh, bears the constellation Orion, uh, and that was chosen by the soldiers as an homage to their commander, uh, Orion, O-R-I-O. O N, uh, the constellation versus Orion, O apostrophe R Y A N. Uh, but it was also signified Orion the Hunter, uh, which was an appealing uh, kind of uh, symbolic uh, meaning for this uh, combat infantry unit. Uh, during the war, uh, the 27th Division is actually loaned alongside another American division to the British Army and actually fights the entire war under uh, alongside British soldiers. Um, when they arrive in the uh, summer of 1918 uh, for training with the British, and they're welcomed as this very fresh, uh, well-trained fighting uh, force. And as such, in the autumn of 1918, uh, the 27th is selected as the spearhead uh, division for an attack on the uh, Hindenburg Line, which was a series of German defenses uh, believed by the Germans to be impregnable. Uh, in three days of fighting, the 27th Division ultimately succeeds in uh, breaking through the Hindenburg Line but at a tremendous cost, uh, nearly uh, 6,500 uh, New Yorkers are casualties uh, during the, the battle uh, and more than 1,000 are killed uh, in that one fight alone. Uh, here we have a, a fragment of the, uh, the, the cliff, the limestone cliffs that, were, that formed part of the German fortifications of the Hindenburg Line. Uh, and on the wall uh, to my right, a uh, tombstone uh, for a Corporal John Higgins of Troy, New York, who was killed uh, on October 17th during the battle uh, at the LaSalle River. This particular tombstone uh, was incorrectly engraved with the date October 12th, uh, 1918, uh, when uh, Corporal Higgins' body was uh, returned home to Troy uh, in Oakwood Cemetery. Uh, it was replaced by a, a tombstone uh, with a proper inscription, and this, uh, this particular tombstone was then donated to the New York State Museum uh, for preservation. Um, the 165th Infantry, formerly New York's 69th, uh, serves uh, with distinction uh, in numerous uh, battles and campaigns, um, also suffering uh, significant casualties during the war. Uh, the 69th and uh, the 165th um, really becomes a, uh, a storied unit in the American Expeditionary Force uh, and, and really with some of the most kind of prominent and colorful characters of the war. Uh, the unit's uh, colonel by the end of the conflict is a man uh, with a nickname Wild Bill Donovan. Uh, he earns the Medal of Honor uh, fighting in World War I. Uh, by the time of the Second World War, he is enlisted uh, by Franklin Roosevelt to create a new organization, the Office of Strategic Services, uh, to carry out clandestine operations in uh, Nazi-occupied Europe uh, and in Asia. And, uh, this OSS becomes the, ultimately, is the precursor to the modern day CIA. Uh, other individuals uh, in the unit are its uh, regimental chaplain, Father Francis Duffy. Uh, Duffy becomes the uh, most decorated chaplain in American Army history. Uh, and here we were uh, privileged enough to display uh, some of the items that uh, Father Duffy would have carried with him into combat. Uh, every time that the unit went over the top uh, during the First World War, Father Duffy went with them carrying nothing but a canteen, uh, a first aid kit, and this, his sacraments kit, uh, where he would move uh, and would be able to perform uh, last rites uh, for uh, fallen American soldiers when necessary. And this is on loan to us from the Lexington Avenue Armory uh, and the New York National Guard in New York City, along with the Medal of Honor uh, from Sergeant Richard O'Neill, uh, who receives it uh, during the Esne Marne Offensive in uh, July of 1918. Uh, Sergeant O'Neill donated this uh, medal to the Lexington Avenue Armory on behalf of all of the soldiers in his unit, all of his comrades uh, who didn't uh, return home. And the final unit that we talk about in this uh, 
section uh, is the, the former New York 15th New York Infantry Regiment, uh, federalized as the 369th Infantry, the Harlem Hellfighters. And this is symbolized uh, prominently with this French Army helmet, uh, very different and distinct from uh, the traditional steel helmet that the American Army used. And for this, uh, this is because uh, when the, the, 369th, uh, the 15th New York arrives in France, uh, General Pershing has no intention of using uh, African Americans in a segregated American Army as combat units. Uh, when, the, when these uh, African American New Yorkers arrive uh, in France, they're put to work as laborers, digging latrines, putting up tents, building railroads, and doing all other menial labor tasks uh, rather than training as infantry, the infantry unit they were. Uh, with, this, with the spring offensive of 1918, the Germans come very close to capturing Paris. Uh, the French army is uh, desperate for reinforcements. Uh, they beg and plead uh, Pershing uh, to provide American soldiers to the French army. Uh, Pershing offers them the 369th Infantry along with three other uh, African American regiments. Uh, the French, who since 1914 had been fighting alongside their colonial forces uh, from uh, West Africa, uh, are uh, more than willing uh, to fight alongside African Americans, uh, black soldiers, uh, and therefore eagerly accept the offer. The 369th serves the entire war with the French army uh, and uh, serves in for 191 days uh, in combat. That's longer than any uh, unit in the American army. Uh, white or black. Uh, <clears throat> some of the more prominent members of the, uh, the regiment include Albany's uh, Henry Johnson, uh, who uh, becomes the first American of any race to receive the French Croix de Guerre with gold palm, that nation's highest award uh, for valor, uh, for his uh, courage on the night of May 14th and 15th, 1918, in which he prevents a uh, German raiding party of approximately uh, 20 to 30 uh, enemy soldiers from uh, capturing his uh, fellow soldier, Needham Roberts. Uh, and then uh, the uh, unit's regimental band leader, uh, Lieutenant uh, James Reese Europe, uh, had joined the National Guard in 1915, uh, was one of the leading uh, band composers and band leaders in the United States, was nationally renowned uh, for his music, uh, raises the regimental band, uh, but he doesn't raise a traditional marching military band. Uh, he raises a jazz band, uh, recruiting uh, the most talented jazz musicians from across the United States uh, and going as far as traveling to Puerto Rico uh, to recruit other uh, woodwind uh, musicians uh, to the cause. Uh, he becomes, uh, not only is he a, a band leader, he's also uh, an officer in the machine gun company. He's actually the first African-American officer uh, to lead troops into no man's land uh, as part of uh, the French army. While New Yorkers are fighting on the, the, uh, the Western Front in France, uh, uh, the state and, and its citizens are also uh, busily engaged in the, the effort on the home front. Uh, between 1917 and 1918, uh, 38,000 New York companies are uh, contracted for various elements of the war effort. And these range from uh, giant companies that are still well known today, such as General Electric, uh, Bausch & Loam, Eastman Kodak, the Watervliet Arsenal uh, just uh, down the road uh, in Watervliet, New York, uh, the longest, most continuous, uh, longest continuously uh, operational arsenal in the United States Army, uh, to even other things that you maybe wouldn't think about uh, in terms of uh, producing for the war effort. Uh, Welch's, grapefruit, uh, Welch's Grape Juice, uh, the company headquartered in Westfield, New York, actually creates a, a a preserve known as grape uh, for use in American rations. Uh, the company Ab Abercrombie & Fitch uh, this was a sporting goods company that actually manufactured um, canvas uh, goods uh, for the American Army. Uh, in the case to my right, we have a, uh, an early aerial camera developed by Eastman Kodak uh, for use by the American Air uh, Service. Uh, George Eastman actually funds the creation of the first Army uh, School of Aerial Photography uh, in Rochester, New York, uh, where pilots and airmen are trained uh, to take pictures from moving aircraft, to develop uh, the film under wartime conditions, and uh, to interpret what they were seeing so that they could relay this intelligence information uh, to their commanders. Uh, Remington Arms uh, continues uh, its service. Uh, when the United States Army enters the war, uh, there are, the U.S. Army only has about 200,000 Springfield rifles uh, at its disposal. And there is no company in the United States that has the capacity to create and to 
fabricate enough Springfields uh, to equip this newly expanding American army. Uh, the American War Plan calls for four million soldiers at arms uh, in a very short period of time. The engineers at Remington, who had just completed a manufacture of uh, one million English uh, Enfield rifles, uh, go to the War Department and uh, demonstrate that with a little bit of retooling they can actually uh, alter the, uh, the rifles, the Enfield rifles, uh, to accept American cartridges uh, and therefore uh, the Model 1917 American Enfield uh, is born. Uh, it becomes the most uh, widely used American long arm of the First World War. Uh, not only is Remington continuing to supply uh, Amer American forces, uh, the, the rifle below it is actually a uh, Motion Nagant uh, rifle uh, with the Imperial uh, Eagle of Tsar Nicholas II. Uh, Remington had also been employed to manufacture uh, one million of those uh, rifles, uh, many of which were not delivered uh, with the uh, onset of the, the Russian Revolution. Uh, so this is a, another example of uh, New York's industrial might playing in a kind of a global capacity. On the wall uh, to my left, uh, New York again uh, asserts itself in terms of its agricultural production uh, during the war. Uh, New York agriculture actually increases production by nearly 30% uh, in the two years of the war in 1917 to 1918. Uh, this is done um, both through uh, a rapid mechanization of, of agriculture. The state actually purchases uh, tractors for uh, and distributes them around the state so that local small farmers could uh, borrow them in order to increase the amount of land under till, uh, but also through the use of things such as the U.S. school gardens, uh, probably more likely known as war gardens in the Second World War era, but where schools and factories and communities and churches would actually create their own, plant their own gardens in order to grow produce uh, for use uh, locally, uh, thereby freeing up produce being grown on larger uh, farms uh, to be uh, processed and shipped overseas to feed uh, not only the American army, uh, the allies, but also the civilians of Europe. New Yorkers also contribute uh, tremendously to the war effort financially, um, both uh, in terms of uh, taxes being paid through donations uh, to various charities, uh, many of the charities uh, having been established long before the war, uh, the Salvation Army, the Red Cross, YMCA, YWCA, and others had actually been doing a lot of charitable work in Europe uh, before the American entry into the war. They just shift their uh, focus to caring for uh, American soldiers. Uh, the war also sees the emergence of new charities, uh, such as this one here, the Red Star Animal Relief, which is actually headquartered uh, here in Albany uh, on State Street, uh, just across from, uh, used to be located just across from the New York State Capitol. Uh, Red Star Animal Relief raising money to uh, buy supplies and uh, medical uh, supplies for uh, the various uh, animals, horses and mules and, and dogs being used by the U.S. Army uh, during the war. This wall here uh, is a very uh, kind of great example of uh, the layers uh, in which our resources here at the State Museum uh, and the State Library and the State Archives can be used in terms of interpreting uh, the war effort. Uh, the poster, Our Boys Need Socks, uh, calling on Americans uh, to knit uh, goods for the American Army, uh, being d displayed alongside a, a knitted wristlets uh, that were made by Red Cross volunteers and given to a New York soldier from Gen uh, Geneva, New York. Uh, and then on the wall, a photograph of the knitting club uh, from the New York State Archives collection uh, showing a, a group of school-age boys uh, knitting uh, scarves or, or some other kind of goods uh, for the war effort. Uh, and the, the ability for this institution to, to tie in um, collections of all three organizations into one story uh, really helps us add depth uh, to the exhibit. Uh, financially, as I mentioned, uh, New York continues to pay uh, most in taxes. Uh, Liberty bonds, uh, New York uh, sur surpasses all other states in terms of the, the amount, number of Liberty bonds purchased. Uh, and then uh, the last portion of this section we're gonna, we will talk about is, uh, is labor shortages that are a result of the war. Uh, as men are going off to fight, um, their, their places in the factories or on the in the fields um, need to be filled by somebody. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, New York and uh, industry turns uh, to women. Um, while World War I doesn't see the 
uh, dramatic increase in the number of women uh, in the workforce that will happen uh, in the Second World War, uh, what we do see is a dramatic shift in the types of work that women are doing. No longer are women uh, working just as cooks or seamstresses or maids or uh, clerks and typists, uh, but they're now uh, shifting into uh, factory work, manufacturing in this case munitions or, or airplanes. Uh, women are working in the fields uh, in place of farmers. Uh, the, uh, the state of New York also creates what's called the Boys Working Reserve in which high school age students could actually be dismissed from class um, uh, in order to uh, work on a farm uh, but still maintain uh, school credits in order to be able to graduate on time. Uh, they would actually supply uh, essays um, about their wartime experiences uh, for credit uh, at their local high schools and uh, we have here we have some of the, the accounts uh, of those, uh, those young men and, and, and girls were also incorporated into this program uh, in 1917 and 1918. Uh, posters such as the YWCA poster uh, for every woman, for every fighter, a woman worker, or here this Joan of Arc saved France, uh, really contribute to the last poster in this section, uh, this poster for women's suffrage. Just like the nurses' uh, uniform uh, in the previous section, uh, these posters create a visual weapon for women suffragists uh, to argue for. Uh, for passage of, of the right to vote here in the United States and in New York in particular. Uh, but it also, these visual reminders don't just energize the suffragists, uh, they're also uh, visual reminders for, uh, for the men who will ultimately have to, to cast those ballots uh, here in New York in November of 1917. And for those men who had voted against it in 1915, uh, it gives them a way to kind of change their, their vote um, without necessarily losing any kind of political face. Um, they can argue that, well, I didn't necessarily believe uh, that women had the right to vote in 1915, but I've seen what they've contributed to the war effort, uh, and therefore I'm going to change my vote now and vote for uh, women's suffrage. This central pylon uh, in the gallery uh, focuses on uh, what we call the war at home. Uh, and this is not the war on the home front, but this is kind of the, the darker side of American patriotism. The posters on the wall were carefully selected uh, in terms of reflecting um, kind of these two uh, conflicting um, strains of, of American patriotism. Uh, here we have uh, a poster featuring an African-American soldier. We're doing our bit, calling on them to do, uh, people to donate to the war savings stamps drive. Uh, the center poster, Americans All, uh, with an honor roll uh, depicting uh, the names of uh, soldiers clearly from uh, various uh, immigrant and ethnic backgrounds, uh, Du Bois, Smith, O'Brien, Sechka, Hauk, um, and on and on, um, to really highlight not only is it the, the immigrant cosmopolitan nature of American society, but also the fact that these men uh, served and, and died as Americans. Um, and then the New York Jews will raise five million uh, dollars, uh, pledged by New York City's Jewish population to raise money for the war effort. All of these groups are uh, trying to visibly demonstrate their patriotism. At the same time, they're increasingly coming under uh, suspicion, um, both of uh, the American authorities, but also uh, oftentimes everyday Americans. Uh, you see the, the rise of uh, vigilante groups, uh, such as the American Defense Society, uh, who are tasked, who's, who are, who task themselves uh, with kind of monitoring uh, first uh, German Americans or uh, enemy uh, aliens, uh, but then as uh, the Bolshevik Revolution takes place in Russia, uh, their suspicion and paranoia expands to other groups. Uh, the photo on the wall, a uh, German uh, being fingerprinted by the New York City Police Department um, as part of what would become a nationwide registry of German uh, residents uh, in the United States. Uh, on the panel here we have um, a telegram to the State Council of Defense inquiring about the uh, status of an investigation into an applicant for the American Red Cross of foreign background, and then uh, two letters uh, to the Council of Defense uh, from the Syracuse and Utica newspapers uh, asking for uh, lists of uh, German residents in those towns uh, that could be published in those local newspapers so that local residents would be able to, uh, to keep an eye on uh, those people. Now, this section is incredibly 
uh, important and it really should hopefully resonate today uh, in terms of uh, our continued struggles as a nation uh, to uh, figure out how we uh, interact and, and uh, deal with kind of these uh, outside others um, during times of conflict um, and, and many of the negative uh, and tragic consequences that result. November 11, 1918, uh, Germany agrees to an armistice ending hostilities on the Western Front. Uh, the United States then begins the, the process of bringing home uh, nearly two million soldiers that have already been deployed in Europe and de uh, demobilizing uh, another two million here in the United States. Uh, so the f this section is divided into two kind of distinct areas. Uh, the first, uh, the homecoming, uh, which is what we what many will traditionally uh, envision in terms of talking about the homecoming for uh, returning soldiers, the, the victory parades, uh, the, the celebrations of uh, these returning troops, uh, massive parades in New York City uh, with millions of New Yorkers uh, crowding the streets to, to cheer on uh, their loved ones as they return home. Here we have posters from the 27th and the 77th Division uh, prior to their uh, victory parades. Uh, but after we, shortly after we get uh, through the, the, the euphoria of this initial homecoming, uh, really this, the more stark reality of uh, life after World War I uh, comes into focus. Uh, as poorly prepared as the American Army was to go to war in 1917, uh, it's even less prepared for the peace that follows in 1918. Uh, there is no uh, veterans administration, there is no real uh, established system of benefits uh, for, uh, for veterans. Uh, there's a very minimal amount of care, including medical care, uh, for returning veterans. Uh, nearly 500,000 New Yorkers serve in the U.S. Army during the war. Uh, the state of New York offers, uh, authorizes 500 scholarships. Um, this is supplemented by private uh, foundations, um, but it's nearly, not nearly enough. That it's not until 1944 that we see the GI Bill uh, after the Second World War, uh, in which really uh, a, an established system of benefits for returning troops uh, comes home. Uh, the New York National Guard, uh, many of these men had been in service uh, for at least three years. Um, there is no guarantee, there is no law requiring uh, employers to maintain uh, their positions. Um, as these soldiers are being uh, returned to the United States and, and uh, let out of the U.S. Army, uh, those wartime contracts that had been um, booming the American economy uh, are canceled. Uh, and you see a, a lot of tension between returning American soldiers uh, and uh, laborers, uh, many times often uh, breaking out in violence. And then we decided to end this section of the exhibit featuring uh, Albany's Sergeant Henry Johnson. Uh, <clears throat> while he's uh, awarded the accolades uh, and is celebrated uh, as a hero at the time of his accomplishments, when he returns home, uh, really the stark uh, realities of racial um, tension in the United States uh, in the 19 uh, teens and early 1920s uh, really come to the forefront. He travels to Kansas City, <coughs> Missouri, uh, to give a speech uh, in which he uh, decries the, the racism uh, experienced by he and his fellow soldiers in the American Army. Uh, he's uh, run out of town. A warrant is issued for his arrest. Uh, he escapes and makes it back to Albany. Uh, but here, when he returns to the Empire State, uh, the silence that, that accompanies his return is resounding. None of his uh, officers, none of his erstwhile supporters and uh, backers uh, come to his defense. Uh, there is no, uh, he's was badly wounded um, in combat. Um, there are no systems of benefits, particularly for African American veterans. Uh, he really just kind of falls off uh, the face of the earth, um, dies uh, 10 years after his return in 1929, uh, largely forgotten by this country until the early 1990s. Uh, when uh, a significant effort is made uh, to get garner him uh, the recognition that he deserved uh, in 1918 and 1919. Uh, in 1996, uh, he's posthumously awarded the Purple Heart uh, by President Clinton. Uh, in 2002, uh, President uh, George W. Bush uh, 
uh, awards him the Distinguished Service Cross, the nation's second highest award uh, for valor after uh, an initial attempt uh, to secure him the Medal of Honor falls short. And finally, uh, in June of 2015, nearly 100 years after uh, his courageous uh, actions on the battlefields of France, uh, President Barack Obama awards Henry Johnson the Medal of Honor uh, for his courage in May of 1918, uh, and finally uh, garners uh, this local hero uh, the recognition that he, he truly deserved. World War I uh, is an often overshadowed uh, conflict um, because of the fact that it, its kind of greatest legacy is the fact that it lays the foundations for uh, the larger and far more deadly conflict uh, just about 20 years later in World War II. Uh, that's not to say that World War I is not incredibly important in terms of our understanding of history. Uh, World War I uh, here in the United States completely transforms uh, the way Americans interact with uh, their federal government. Uh, the expectations and obligations of citizenship are, are redefined uh, in terms of what's expected uh, of Americans during the time of war. Uh, there are uh, darker sides to this legacy as well. Uh, the Bolshevik Revolution uh, in, the so in Russia uh, in 1917-1918 leads to, uh, here in New York and across the nation, a, a Red Scare uh, in which uh, persecuted groups such as uh, socialists, uh, but also uh, Jews, African Americans, suffragists uh, increasingly fall under suspicion uh, by governmental authorities. Uh, the police state that had been established uh, during the war continues uh, into the 1920s uh, with raids on groups such as the uh, National Civil Liber Liberties Bureau, uh, the NAACP, uh, African American leaders are uh, monitored and uh, surveilled by, uh, by the Bureau of Investigation and other law enforcement. Uh, an entire uh, division of military intelligence uh, is devoted to the concept of Negro subversion. Uh, World War I also leads to the end of mass immigration uh, that had been uh, common throughout United States history. Uh, 1924 uh, legislation creates a quote, the first quota system uh, restricting immigration here based on country of origin. Uh, this is a, a trend that doesn't uh, reverse itself until the 1960s when New York Congressman Emanuel Seller successfully introduces uh, legislation abolishing the quota system. Uh, this quota system established in 1924 will have dramatic uh, ramifications uh, in the 1930s uh, as uh, primarily Jewish refugees attempt to escape uh, Europe uh, following the rise of Adolf Hitler and the National Socialists in Germany. Uh, World War I also uh, dramatically, uh, the, the Treaty of Versailles that ends the war dramatically redraws not only the map of Europe, uh, but also the global map. Um, countries such as Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, uh, and the Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia, uh, Estonia are created. Uh, the Soviet Union emerges as an entity uh, following uh, the First World War. Uh, but also in terms of uh, the impact today, uh, World War I also sees uh, the redrawing of maps in pr primarily in the Middle East. Uh, the Sykes-Picot Accord in 1916 establishes uh, what become the states of Iraq, Syria, uh, and others in the Middle East. Uh, and the, the uh, ramifications and, and the ill uh, hostile feelings are continuing to, to boil over in the conflicts that we're witnessing uh, in the Middle East through today. Um, so while World War I does lay the foundations uh, uh, and the conditions that allow for the rise of totalitarian dictators, uh, including Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini, um, there is a very far more complex and, and really elaborate story in terms of why World War I is important and why we should continue to study uh, this often uh, forgotten uh, conflict.